I used to have this really bad habit of not other girling my climate activism. I would make sure that people knew that I came to sustainability because of the injustices of the fast fashion movement. Not because when I was 10, I fell in love with the bugs in my backyard or that I loved visiting the trout at my local stream. This seemed really important to make sure that people understood that my climate activism was rooted in justice. And I even made a TikTok this summer about the comparing me to these outdoorsy climate activists and saying that I'm not like them which I deleted because I got zero views and I need social validation. True climate activists, I thought, were people-oriented, justice-oriented, jobs-oriented. Why did I have to make this distinction? Hey friends, it's Sarah coming to you live from the outdoors. Today's video, we're gonna be talking about the concept of bioregionalism. And I came across this term in a book that I just finished called Resisting the Attention Economy by Jenny O'Dell. Have you ever read a book where it's like the brain blast from Jimmy Neutron is going off and all of these neurons and everything's connecting? That's this book. The way that O'Dell describes her relation between place, region, time, attention, is so apt for our digital age. I highly, highly recommend that you pick up this book at your local library as soon as you can. Let's dive into these ideas. Bioregionalism is observation and recognition of what grows where, as well as an appreciation for those complex web of relationships among those actors. It's the idea that place and nature and time are so important to how we move through in our identity in the world. And of course, these concepts are far from new. Indigenous peoples from around the world before and today are still using this kind of philosophy to guide their interactions with the world. Throughout the book, Odell describes her changing relationship with place and time through her wandering through the Rose Garden of Oakland and getting to know her neighborhood birds. I too felt this yearning for connection to place that was hard to put into words. And the first time I really felt in and of a place was when I studied abroad in France Yes, I studied abroad in France. If I don't mention in every video, how you know I studied in France? When I ran out of travel money, I had a choice to make. I could either spend the rest of my time in my small flat, or I could explore the city that was my hometown for the time being, which I'd really only considered a stopover point between different places of travel. So I chose the latter, and I spent my days wandering the city, taking trams and buses all the way to the end of the line, going to every park and farmer's market, and it was exhilarating. I remember this feeling of when two places in the city met at a crossroads and I hadn't realized that they were joined before. My whole visual spatial map in my head was just blown apart and created new. By tuning into the detail and to really doing nothing, I had the most enriching month. But I did not have to be in France to do this. You do not have to be in France to do this. It starts with where you are now. In aspects of physical space, where in your city or region have you never been? Are there parks or anything nearby that you've always said, maybe one day I'll visit, but I haven't yet? Now, privilege is a huge factor in this, and it's not safe for everyone to go and walk their streets or not be sidewalks or obviously now in, in times of corona we need to be safe and, and staying away from people as much as possible so if you live in a city it might be a bit harder but my challenge to you is to think of one place that you can find that you can really explore it and go into detail and depth with it and if you can think of a place or you already have one in mind i would love to read a description if you put it in the comment section Going deeper than place is a connection between place and time. If you live in the United States, you're most likely on stolen indigenous land. And if you're not in the United States, there have been people and beings there or are people and beings there for millennia. Do you know who they are? Do you know who was in the space that you are now before you? It's such a joy to learn the history of the place that you're in, the names of the mountains, the birds, the flowers. Oop. The sun has graced her presence. Odell writes this beautiful excerpt as she's describing following a creek she hadn't noticed all these years growing up in Silicon Valley. Nothing is so simultaneously familiar and alien as that which has been present all along. The creek is a reminder that we do not live in a simulation. 
a streamlined world of products, results, experiences, reviews, but rather on a giant rock whose other life forms operate according to an ancient, oozing, almost thonic logic. And I had to look it up too. Thonic, concerning belonging to or inhabiting the underworld. But it's really this idea that the detail and the beauty of of paying attention really enriches our lives. For me, this realization has grounded my climate activism because when we think about the age of the universe and the earth and then our species, and then really in the past 200 years, the destruction that we've done to this planet, it just puts things in perspective in the history of history. Back to the whole not a big nature person thing I claim for a long time. In the past six months, I've completely changed this mindset. One of my New Year's resolutions actually is to go on 30 hikes before the end of the year. So what changed? A couple of big things. First, I moved back in with my family in Northern California. We get the little train. And I swear, every time I come home, the trains are louder, the frogs are louder, and the trees are greener. Being immersed in my mom's garden, where I am now, and being close to hiking trails and having a blank Google calendar and having to take COVID precautions has just naturally pushed me more outside in a way that I've really never been in any period of my life before. Additionally, at the tail end of last year, my mental health was in a pretty rough spot. And I found that being outside and turning to mindfulness along with therapy and medication was really good for my anxiety. It helped me rethink how I view and live in this weird time in my life. Side note here, truly meditation, mindfulness, the works, took reading several books and several hours of practice before I even realized that it was working. So, and along with the other things that I was doing for my mental health. So I'm not saying that if you just pay attention, your anxiety and depression will go away. I'm not saying that at all. I swear I'm not a quack. Like it's one tool in the toolbox. But really back then when I said that I don't like nature, I was falling prey to this colonial idea that nature is for a certain type of person. I never grew up really camping much or hiking. I spent my middle school summers inside watching Glee on DVD. Hiking and camping just seemed so complicated and it's not for me. And beyond my kind of trivial barrier to entry, there's a bigger problem with access to natural spaces. And I always think back to this story that I read when I was living in San Diego about these kids in the City Heights community, which is a low income, um, pr predominantly immigrant and refugee community who wanted to go to the beach and they had to take tra public transportation and it took them two hours to get to the beach when driving takes less than 20 minutes. And you can just see the inequality there and in access to who is allowed to go to these natural spaces. There's also this notion that we have to go to nature. We have to vacation to be in nature. Nature is elsewhere. But if you stepped outside, whatever that means for you right now, what would you hear? Would you see some weeds growing up through the sidewalk, some birds, and <laughs> they just flew overhead. Our built environments often mask what was natural spaces before, but if we look close enough and pay attention to the details, we can realize that all spaces are natural spaces. Rooting yourself is no small task. Where my family is now is not where I grew up per se. And so whenever people ask me, where are you from? I have a really hard time answering because do I say the city that I live in now? Do I say the city that I spent the most time in? Could I say the city that I felt myself come alive and be most of myself in? Does it have to be a city? Can it be a region? What about how, where my ancestors lived? And don't get me started on the ancestors thing. I went deep into ancestry research this summer because I realized I have no concept of family history. Truly, what does it mean to be from somewhere? The fact that I'm asking these questions is just a testament to how fast society has progressed for our small little monkey brains. It's jarring to realize that you've always thought on this small time scale with no really regard for the past or respect for the future. When you have no place and cultural identity and rituals to pass on to the next generations, like many white people do, 
especially in the United States, it's hard for our little monkey brains to think about preserving things for the next millennia. So Sarah, <laughs> with all this information, you say, what do you want me to do with it? And I say you should do nothing. However you want to describe it, this history, philosophy, mindset has really helped me personally with my anxiety, as I mentioned, and I really think that it can help other people in the face of such raging injustice and climate anxiety. Turning our attention to new radio waves and paying attention is truly an act of resistance. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and like this video if you like this content and you can also give a one-time donation to help support this channel. Link in the description. And thank you friends for watching. I'll see you in the next one.